I want to go back and, and talk generally right now. Let's start in the middle of the decade, 2003 to 2004, something like that. Um, maybe even before that. What Describe what it was like to work under David Miscavige in general. In this decade, Yes. It was a deter working with, under David Miscavige from 2000 forward was a steadily deteriorating situation. Um, and it's interesting you picked 2000 because in November 1999 was a big snapping point with the guy because Judge Moody in the civil case allowed him to be named in an amended complaint. This is a Lisa McPherson case. In the Lisa McPherson is actually the Dell Lybrick executor, Fanny McPherson, mother, plaintiff versus Church of Scientology. And um, uh, that was like the explosion of all explosions um, that he was now potentially going to get deposed and be embroiled and his name would be embroiled in that litigation. And uh, I don't think he ever recovered from that, quite frankly. I mean, the guy was a deteriorating spiral from that point forward. He became progressively more uh, antagonistic, violent, um, irrational. Talk to us about some of the, the violence. Uh, what kinds of incidents did you see? Regularly, David Miscavige would, uh, in the middle of a conference, in a conference room full of people at the in base, physically assault, assault and uh, punch, slap open-handed, grab by the neck, throw to the floor, uh, a number of international executives. I mean, almost the, you know, the very highest part of the Church of Scientology international hierarchy from the WDC chairman, which is the highest post within CSI, which is Mark Yeager, uh, he got beat on in, in, in the 2000s. I probably saw him get beat up pretty severely half a dozen to a dozen times. Mark Ingber, who also held that post but was more often on the dub, uh, uh, watchdog committee member for finance, which is the highest, highest financial person within the ecclesiastical hierarchy, I saw him slap him around, you know, beat him up on a number of occasions. Ray Midoff, who was a senior CS International, the highest technical person in the technical hierarchy of the Church of Scientology, he would reg regularly hit this guy open handed upside the head real hard and, and jar him. Um, or grab him by the neck and throw him on the floor. And Mike Rinder, who was the WDC member for OSA, Office of Special Affairs, which handled all external facing affairs, probably got it worse than anybody else. I saw him get beat up at least a dozen times uh, just in those last four years or so that I was in. And some of them were pretty pretty gruesome. Now, Mike Rinder, uh, many of the public will recognize him. He is the, the face of Scientology. You see him on CNN uh, and other networks uh, taking Scientology's position on dif different issues. Is that correct? Yes, for probably a 10, 15 year period, he was uh, the face of Scientology to the, to the general public. Mm -hmm. And you say he was beaten. Uh, he, he was a favorite target of Mr. Miscavige. Yeah, he was the most. He was the most regular. I mean, I saw Tom Devocht, who was Mr. Clearwater. Basically, he was a, the commanding officer of the uh, Commodore's Messenger Organization, Clearwater, for a number of years in the 90s and into the 2000s. I mean, he was the glue that kept the whole operation together. He oversaw the, all the buildings and all that. I saw him get beat up a couple of times. In fact. The second time I saw it happen, it was uh, in front of a number of people, and it was the thing that sickened me so much that it prompted me to, to get on my motorcycle and get out of there because it was so gruesome, and I liked Tom so much that I was afraid I was going to do something I would really regret uh, in retaliation for it, so I removed myself from the scene, and that was the day I literally got on my motorcycle and headed down the road. Okay. Uh, by this time, you had been in Scientology 27 years? Right. right. Um, I mean, what do you, not just Tom's, uh, the attack on Tom, but the others as well, what are you thinking as you're seeing these different attacks unfold before your eyes? Um, it's, it's, it's different, but I, I got to tell you, Tom, my thought was I really do, and I'm just, I'm just realizing this now 
quite frankly. That November 99 uh, incident of Miscavige getting pulled into the civil case really was a bit of a snapping point. I mean, he always was a brute, and he always slapped around people for different things, but I wasn't so exposed to it because I was always off doing something else, and he seldom came at me physically, um, and never like he did with those guys. Um, but it was a progressive thing, and I, and, I, and I thought I saw it as a dwindling spiral of the guy losing control of his mental faculties uh, steadily over that period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, you want to know what was going through my head? That was what was going through my head. Um, you I mean, initially, you're conditioned to believe that people have screwed things up so royally that that is the appropriate response. And in fact, I had my um, uh, share of people that I slapped around to, and I don't feel good about it, and I seek them out, and I try to apologize where I can. But never did I do, do things like he did to Mike Rinder or Tom DeVock. I mean, I remember getting Mike Rinder. And, you know, whacking him upside the head with an open hand, then punching him in the stomach, grabbing him by the neck so that, you know, so hard that he had, uh, you know, stress marks on his neck for a week, throw him on the ground, rip his face against a tree where his mouth's bleeding, and then start kicking him in the ribs while he's down. I was mean, it, this, is, this is, this is, uh, this is the kind of beatings I'm talking about. Was that the incident in uh, Christmas, near Christmas, 1997? Yes. Can you paint us a little picture of that incident uh, again? Okay, it's, it's uh, late 97. There was a lot of uh, reports coming up from Clearwater because this was the, I think it was the first year of the Lisa McPherson uh, vigils and protests and that sort of thing. So there was a bit of media. And this Miscavige would react really insanely to, to bad media. And uh, it just, it was a real tense period. And Miscavige was sick and he was down in his room, which is next to this uh, lounge that, that was made available for executives. And are we out in California now? We're out in California, we're at the Ent base. Okay. Out by Hammett. And uh, I get a phone call from Dave's assistant and wife, Shelly. She says, you need to come down to Dave's room right away. So I ran down the hill, which is about 100 yards. Ran down there. It was a cold night in December. It was around Christmas time, '97, and I stood there. And she just went like this, and I just stood there. And then, and, there, and there's a screen door. I couldn't see anything behind the screen door. It's Shelley standing outside the door with me. And then all of a sudden, about two minutes later, I see Mike Rinder coming around the other corner, huffing and puffing. He must have run up from where his offices are, which is about 300 yards. He rounds the corner, and right when he's in vision of the screen door, the screen door fl flies open. Miscavige comes running out in a terry cloth, terry cloth bathrobe and just starts beating on uh, Mike Rinder across the face and the stomach. Mike's leaning over. He grabbed Mike around the neck, swung him into a tree. There was a little tree outside the door there, and he cut his lip across the tree, flipped him into the ivy, started beating on him, and started kicking him. Um, there was nothing said. There was no reason given. I had no idea why I was there. I later sort of realized remorsefully that I guess this was sort of me being the silent, silent enforcer. Um, you know, from, I'm looking at it from Mike's viewpoint. <laughs> why would I be there? Okay. Finally, he, I think Riscavage realizes he's hurt this guy. His, his lip was bleeding. There was blood coming down his lip. Uh, he tells him to get up. Mike gets up. He, kick, he opens up the door to the lounge, which is right next to his room. There's a bar in there. He's got all this fancy scotch that he gets uh, sent in from the IAS from Scotland. Pulls one off the shelf, gives, uh, pours a half a glass, puts it on the counter for Rinder. He says, here, take this. Maybe that'll make you feel better. And then left the room. Mm. And okay. Yeah. Now, I compared, okay, I don't know what it was about to this day. I don't know why he did it. I assume it was because there was a bunch of stuff flapping in Clearwater. But Tom, nothing was said. Mm. Not a single thing. Yeah. That's the type of behavior I'm talking about. When I say dwindling, I mean, initially when I saw some acts of violence, maybe six, even maybe even six, eight years earlier, there was usually something that happened. You know what I'm saying? Like somebody defied him somehow. And then 
you know, I don't think it was ever justified, but it seemed to have some sort of justification. But it got to the point where this guy is literally pulling a stunt like that. You know, there was another incident with Mike Rinder in Clearwater uh, that you witnessed. We were in Clearwater uh, probably in 2000 or 2000, probably 2000, 1999 or 2000, when we were very deeply and intimately involved in the handling of the criminal and civil cases. There was a two-year period down here. I think Dave was here full-time, and so was Mike and I. And we had a conference room on the third floor of the West Coast building, which is the building caddy corner to the Sandcastle Hotel. It's a little ma management building. It's not a big one. It's the old stucco, South Florida stucco-style building. Um, Mike and I used to operate from a conference room. Dave had a whole suite of offices that adjoined that, and he had a big office at the end of the hall. One day, and I can't recall to this day what it was about, uh, but I know Rinder was sitting at a, at, a, at a conference table, you know, with a chair, so he sort of pinned in like this, uh, you know, with the tables here, and Dave comes up from the side of him unannounced and hit him up open-handed upside the head, knocked him back, shoved the chair in so Mike is defenseless and Mike screamed and he started and Miscavige started screaming at him saying are you trying to make me wrong by screaming what do you you know he started uh, screaming obscenities at him and uh, then grabbed Mike by the neck and twisted him out of the chair Mike was sort of pinned in because he was the chair was pinned up against the thing so he couldn't easily roll off and Miscavige is ripping his neck like this uh, pulled him down and just threw him down on the floor by his neck. And Mike was really yelping in pain. And he, you know, I've seen Mike get beat before and he never wouldn't say a peep. But he was really in pain. And I, I know for certain that he was, that this was, a, this was a, a, a severe injury because I was working with him day in and day out during that entire period. In other words, we, our organizations were in LA and, and Int respectively. When we were down there, we were just working for Miscavige. So, Mike and I would drive home together at night at two in the morning. We'd drive in at nine in the morning. We'd eat breakfast. You know, we lived together basically. He was he was uh, his neck, neck was all kinked up and he was limping around like stuck like this for at least a week a after that beating. How did that attack end? The, did Mr. Miscavige walk out of the room? What happened? Just stormed out. Made his point, whatever his point was, because he's always screaming and hollering at the guy when he's when he's you know beaten mm -hmm. on him for some perceived slight or perceived wrong. But Tom, by that point, I can't give you the, you know, it, they lost their significances. It got so routine and regular, you know, he can't always attach significances to them because, like I said, you know, sometimes they just didn't have any significances attached to them. How routine and regular was it? I mean, was was this every meeting that happened uh, once a week, or could you describe? Yeah, well, you know, it's hard for me to say because, uh, you know, I was so often out doing things at different in different places. Like I go off to Clearwater and be gone for nine months, so mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, privy to what was going on at Int. Or I'd be off to L.A. to handle something for a month at a time. Or, you know, I was on the Tom Cruise thing for six months where I didn't do anything else. I was at the, the Celebrity Center in Los Angeles. Okay, but. During the last nine months or so, after I had done a big stint in Clearwater on the McPherson cases and come back towards the end of 03, during the last couple of months there, I mean, it was every day. He, Miscavige was beaten on somebody every day, and it got so bad that he then literally, at, in late 83, excuse me, in January of 04, he finally got everybody who was connected with international management the whole watchdog committee, the uh, International Management Executive Committee, which included Guillaume Lasserve, the ED International, all of the senior CS office, all the senior technical people in Scientology, and literally locked them in a double wide, uh, where he would then just about every day come in and beat somebody up, Tom. And then, it, then that wasn't good enough. He started inciting others to start hitting others, like, like really pushing on them. And really saying, you know, really needling them like well, you're a suppressive person if because you're letting this ethics, you're just as suppressive as that person if you don't, you know what I'm saying? And it was getting to the point where people were starting to slap each other, one another around. 